right. Right. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for an important and timely panel discussion on inclusive internationalization and the role of higher education in addressing the global refugee crisis. My name is Nicole Longstaff. I'm a manager of strategic initiatives at McMaster University and one of today's event organizers. Today's presentation is hosted by McMaster University in partnership with the Catalyst 2030 Canada chapter as part of Catalyzing Change Week the world's largest event led by social innovators and entrepreneurs to share knowledge, exchange ideas, and accelerate collaborative systems change. Um, today, we are very fortunate to have um, with us an outstanding group of thought leaders who have very generously gifted us with their time and energy in sharing their perspectives on this topic. If you have any questions, ideas you would like to share throughout today's presentation, um, you're invited to do so in the chat. Um, we also ask that you kindly keep your microphones muted throughout. Um, so without further ado, uh, to introduce our speakers and officially kick off today's discussion, I'm very pleased to introduce you to today's discussion moderator, Peter Masher. Um, so among his many accomplishments, Peter is a professional engineer and a professor in the Department of Engineering Physics at McMaster University, chairing the department from 1994 to 2000. And from 2003 to 2014, he served as the Associate Dean Research and External Relations of the Faculty of Engineering. And since 2014, he has overseen McMaster's international portfolio as Vice Provost International Affairs. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much, Nicole, for this kind introduction. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to uh, mo uh, moderate the, uh, today's discussion and, and have such a stellar panel uh, uh, of, of experts who will uh, provide us with their, with their insight in the matter. Um, as we all know, the global refugee crisis is one of the most urgent and uh, pressing challenges of our time. An unprecedented 82 million people around the world have been forced to flee their homes. Among them are 26 million refugees, around 42% of them are under the age of 18. There are also millions of stateless people who have been denied a nationality and lack access to basic rights, just as education, healthcare, employment, and freedom of movement. So the principal questions are what role can higher education institutions play in collaboration with governments, NGOs, social innovators, and communities? both locally and globally to address the complexities of this hum humanitarian crisis and foster inclusive internationalization. Before we uh, start with, uh, with the proceedings, um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that McMaster University is located on the traditional territory shared between the Haudenosaunee and Mississauga nations and is protected by the dish with one spoon wampum agreement. I believe that in particular in the context of today's conversation, it is crucial to recognize that indigenous peoples of Canada and the world have led the work of protecting the lands, waters and health of our communities for long before the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals were created. And that they will continue to be our leaders into the future. As we progress towards these goals, we must remember that we are guests on this land and in this work. The SDGs intersect not only with the needs of Indigenous communities, but will be strengthened by the expertise Indigenous peoples bring to these goals. It's now my uh, great pleasure to briefly introduce, um, uh, introduce our panelists. Um, we have uh, Sarah Asalia, the Executive Director of Newcomer Women's uh, Services. Uh, Sarah is an award-winning leader who brings more than 13 years of experience working internationally and in Canada, in various sectors, including non-for-profit, NGOs, think tank, and higher education institutions. She holds a master's in education and higher education from the University of Toronto and is an incoming PhD student in the Department of Leadership, Higher and Adult Education at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. After Sarah, 
Um, we uh, we are, will be pleased to hear from Randy Sukier, founder of the Diversity Institute at Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly was known as, as Ryerson University, a, a very recent uh, name change um, uh, and, and a most significant contribution, I believe, um, to truth and rec reconciliation. Uh, Randy is the Diversity Institute founder and the academic director of the Women's Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub and a research lead in the Future Skills Center. She is a celebrated uh, author uh, and um, holds uh, a PhD, an MBA, and a Master's of Arts and honor honorary doctorates from both Laval and uh, Concordia Universities in, in Canada. Third uh, on the list, uh, we have Jenny Dixon, uh, the current provost of Universities 21, Universitas 21, um, a global education network of 28 uh, research intensive universities spanning 18 uh, countries. Uh, in her role as, as the provost of Universitas 21, she oversees the strategic direction of the network, working closely with the presidents or vice chancellors and the senior leaders. Uh, Jenny was seconded to the provost role uh, just recently from the University of Auckland in New Zealand, where she was deputy vice chancellor for strategic engagement and a professor of planning. And last but by no means least, uh, I am delighted to have uh, Bonnie Boao uh, on the panel. Uh, Bonnie is a professor and the Senator William McMaster Chair in Global Human Rights at McMaster University. He is also an independent expert of the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights to Development in the UN Human Rights Office in Geneva. He has decades of experience in human rights as an educator, policymaker, and practitioner, and has taught in universities in Africa, Europe, the United States, and Canada. So I'm, I'm sure you will agree with me that uh, this is a truly outstanding and stellar panel, and I can't wait to hear uh, from our first panel, uh, panelist, uh, Sarah. Could I please invite you to uh, bring some of your thoughts to the table? Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, such a thoughtful uh, introduction and overview of, of the topic of, of today. I am going to just quickly share my screen. Um, I did put some slides together. Um, Right, thank you, Peter, again, and uh, thank you, uh, Nicole, for inviting me uh, for this exciting and very timely and important topic. Um, I'll start with a little bit of background information. I know Peter has given us a little bit of data and stats around uh, the global refugee crisis and uh, the number of displaced people globally, but we do know that war, conflict, food insecurity, human rights violations, and climate change are major drivers to forced migrations nowadays, um, and displacement are our major contributors um, to the global refugee crisis. In addition to these all factors, we know that actually the global um, pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and its devastating impact and consequences um, has created a severe humanitarian crisis, which has led so many around the globe to be displaced. What we know is that there is 82.4 million people who are forcibly displaced from their homes. Um, half of them are under the age of 18, 50% of that number. And what we know is two thirds of people dis displaced across all borders actually come um, from five um, countries. Um, and what we also know is that there is only 3% of refugees who has access to higher education. Um, within that introduction, I, say, I think Peter uh, has posed the question of what role can higher education play in responding and addressing the global refugee crisis and how can we do this as higher education institutions? Um, so I thought to, um, to start with a little bit of um, overview around some of the challenges that facing refugees to access education in the first place, because we are talking about educational institutions here. Uh, and I came across these two quotes that has really resonated with me. One of them talks about um, how attaining higher education plays a pivotal role um, 
um, and the integration and inclusion of refugees in the Canadian society. And the other one is uh, from the Ontario Human Rights Commission that talks about why, why education is extremely important and, and the impact of denying education to, to a certain population. Now, the challenges facing refugees to access education, we know that there are so many challenges, including um, learning gaps due to interrupted schooling. Some of these refugees have been uh, fled their countries, have been in different host countries, spending a lot of time in, in refugee camps. And by the time they are resettled, we do see a trend of many of these refugees has three year gap, four year gaps, and sometimes even more of interrupted schooling. We know that there is an issue of academic credentials. When we when you are a refugee fleeing war, sometimes you just you just flee. You don't you don't you don't get the chance to take anything with you. And we know that a lot of refugee students are unable to access their previous credentials, which constitute a huge barrier for them to apply for education and access education. We know that there is financial um, language barriers. We know that there is information bar barriers and lack of knowledge around understanding how, how do higher education systems really operate and function um, in the host countries of refugees. And um, it's no secret that higher education is pretty pricey and expensive, let alone when we are talking about a population that is um, vulnerable and might not have access to financial support and resources. Um, so that is a little bit of overview about some of the challenges that refugee population face to access education. And it's not a surprise why there is only 3%. Uh, but on the other side, within the Canadian context, on top of these challenges, we know that there are um, other challenges facing refugees or migrants with precarious status. So within the Canadian context, there is the procedural barrier. So when, some, when a refugee wants to apply, they, they are required to disclose their status. And that sometimes is, is really kind of nerve wracking. Um, and then the financial challenges, especially I'm talking here about um, those migrants or refugees with precarious status, they end up paying international student fees, not domestic fees but they also don't have access to financial aid such as OSAP and, or institutional awards and scholarships. And those barriers, those specific barriers, don't only shut doors to opportunities that um, other quote-unquote Canadians take for granted, such as accessing education, but it also forced them into really precarious employment, housing, social isolation, and make them vulnerable to abuse. In terms of refugee resettlement needs, thinking of the barriers, um, we know that the needs will include housing, employment, financial stability, language, social and emotional support and cultural integration um, and so on. Um, I really liked this table um, from the Canadian Council of Refugees because it really talked about kind of the holistic settlement and integration and what this looks like. Because oftentimes when we talk about settlement, we, we, we look at it from a very narrow perspective. Settlement, you need to find a job as a refugee, right? The first thing you need to provide for your family. Most of the services out there really focused on, on jobs or language training. But we know that settlement is always short term while we really need to focus on the long-term integration and the four dimension, including economic, social, cultural, and political. When I look at this table and I know you probably are wondering what does this has to do with higher education? Um, I come from higher education background. I, I, I worked for quite some time in higher education and I know that some of these already are offered by universities and colleges as part of their support systems or programming. Again, quote unquote, to the traditional students. So entering the job market, we do a lot of career counseling, education, a lot of innovative programming to help our students, um, a recent grad, to find a job, to establish a social network, to we do a lot of civic engagement, how to be a global citizen. We do all of that as part of what we offer to our traditional student. The question is really, do we do anything that is more catered and focused to refugee students who bring who has quite unique um, needs and, and have unique barriers and challenges to really not only access education, but integrate within the, the higher education system and do well in schooling and, and graduate. So um, I, I don't have answer to that question. I'm, I'm hoping to dig deep when I start my PhD on what exists out there in terms of support system and infrastructure that really focus on uh, supporting refugee student population. And then 
Um, that takes me to our topic today, internationalization, inclusive internationalization. And I was doing a little bit of scanning to better understand what is internationalization. And the definition has evolved. But every time I look at the definition, it's broad enough to that institutions can incorporate anything within that definition. You can see that the definition started of being a process of integrating an international, intercultural, and global dimension into the purpose, functions, or delivery of post-secondary institutions. Um, then the definition has evolved um, and, and, and the concept of um, comprehensive internationalization has emerged and that is defined as a commitment confirmed through actions um, to infuse international and comparative perspectives throughout the teaching, research, and service missions of higher education. And I really like that because it has a, a certain focus on action. There is a strategy, there is a policy, but this is a call to action for institutions to really try to infuse and embed all international and comparative perspective in everything across the institution. And then we know that um, another term that I came across, which is in inclusive internationalization. And according to the International Association of Universities, that is defined as integrating key concepts of equity, cultural diversity, social responsiveness, and mutual benefits in internationalization. And I also looked at what under some institutional um, internationalization strategies, what do these strategies look like? Or what kind of internationalization activities our institutions are focused on? And most of them include, but not limited to faculty and student exchanges, mobility programs, research agreement, international student enrollment is a big one that I, that I, I see a theme is, is in, in a lot of um, higher education institution strategies. International ranking is a big one. Um, and then academic exchange programs. Now, reflecting on all these definitions and the kind of activities that is provided by, by, by most Canadian institutions under the internationalization strategy is what is met, missing from these definitions. Um, and again, I haven't done a comprehensive analysis or scan to, to understand, but so far what I came across I do see the refugee missing. I do see the, the word refugee missing. I don't see any concrete commitments or strategies under those internationalization policy that talks about, this is our institutional response and commitment to address the refugee crisis. Um, to me, most of what have been done so far by these in institutions, are reactive more than proactive. Um, I haven't seen anything centralized by the internationalization office that says, this is what we are doing. So to me, what seems is an ad hoc scattered initiatives coming from, for example, the Faculty of Arts is coming together to create a scholarship for Afghan refugees because we have an Afghan refugee crisis. Five years ago, or sorry, in 2015, the focus was on Syrian refugee crisis. So we see a lot of institutions are responding to that crisis. But prior to that, there wasn't any kind of initiative to say, here is our strategy. Will Canada welcome refugees from all over the globe, not only from Syria or Afghan or Ukraine? But to me, it was more, I don't see these. I don't see refugee programming that is embedded in our policies, strategies, practices, cultures, or programs. And it seems, as I said, not really centralized, but more ad hoc. The Faculty of Engineering is doing something. The Faculty of Business is doing something. Um, and we don't know if there is a central program where it could be hosted. Could it? Could a, a refugee program that offers pathways to education or support systems be hosted under the International Student Office? We, I'm, I'm not sure. It doesn't seem the right place, but could it be? Could it be hosted by Internationalization Office or Global Education and Engagement Office at, at higher education? Um, I'm not quite sure because, again, I haven't seen. Um, to my knowledge, any program that is being centralized and really speaks to refugee students and refugee student needs. And then speaking of the role of higher education, um, there are different ways that we can really respond to that global refugee crisis. We know that there's 
a lot of education, teaching, scholarship, and research happening. In Canada, there are, in, in different universities, there are a lot of research centers that are focused on the topic of migration, displaced migration, and refugees. So uh, the higher education plays a role through education, through building knowledge, through creating knowledge, disseminating knowledge through teaching and through scholarship, which is wonderful. We need to continue to do that. But we also need to take a look and rethink and reimagine our internationalization policies and practice and, and try to be inclusive, intentionally inclusive as much as possible. Um, in our response to the global refugee crisis, we can also start thinking about access to education pathways for displaced and refugee people and those with precarious status, because unfortunately in Canada, um, so far there is one institution, one university, and I will be talking more about it later um, in terms of creating pathways to students with precarious status. Um, the response could also look like creating an, a support infrastructure for these refugees, not only to access, but what happens beyond we give them access and welcome them? Do we have legal transition, language, culture, academic, career support, and financial support for these students? Are we really have the infrastructure to set them up for success? Or all we can do is just maybe provide some scholarships to help them and then I don't know what happened next if, if we don't have that support infrastructure. And then um, we have seen really some nice initiatives happening in the higher education um, in Canada in terms of initiative um, that focus on the resettlement of refugees utilizing the private sponsorship program. So here I talk a little bit about the higher education approaches to refugee resettlement, education and integration. And I put together some really best practices or good examples on how some Canadian higher education um, has taken some initiative um, to respond to the global refugee crisis, whether through resettlement, whether through education or integration. And I see Wendy is smiling. Um, I come from Toronto Metropolitan Universities and, and I'm proud of those initiatives that we have done. Most notably to mention um, the, uh, the Lifeline Syria Challenge and, and numbers speaks uh, uh, by themselves, raised $5 million, million and sponsored 400 Syrian refugees. That is a higher education in initiative. That is students, faculty, staff coming together to respond to that specific Syrian global refugee crisis through resettlement. But I know it went further than resettlement because within the Lifeline Syria Challenge, there was a lot of committees and subcommittees that are offering peer-to-peer -peer support, that are offering settlement, that are offering language training, that are offering mentorship for refugees. So that is actually one of the best practices that I keep coming back and see, can we do more of that? And we did. So most recently also led by um, um, Wendy and other community leaders, they came together and they founded the Lifeline Afghanistan, which kind of also um, focused on uh, the resettlement of Afghan refugees. Uh, we do see that other institutions as well, or other organizations such as um, the Board University Services of Canada through the student refugee uh, program, they welcome refugees and they help with their resettlement and education and um, employment as well. Other best practices or initiatives include the University of Toronto Mississauga Refugee Pathway. Um, this program offer recent refugees who may meet traditional admission requirements, but who do not have access to required documents. Again, big barrier for refugees. The opportunity to create a basis of admission on which to be considered for entry to undergraduate degree studies at the university. Um, there is also the Scholars and Students at Risk Award Program. Um, the award is $10,000 and it's open to refugee students on admission to the university, undergraduate or graduate program, again, great initiatives. Uh, we have Western University, again, created specific uh, scholarship um, to Afghan uh, refugee students. Um, we have Wilfrid Laurier University, they have an admission policy, which is a fantastic policy, and then they do international student overcoming 
poor. And it's really important here to note that when we talk about higher education, we talk oftentimes about the institution, but that doesn't mean that within the institution, there are different bodies um, and different groups that take initiative to respond to the global refugee crisis, including student groups and student union and student led initiatives, which is fantastic to see our students are engaged um, and are trying to find solutions and come together to address the global refugee crisis. York University by far is the most progressive university um, in responding and addressing to the global refugee crisis, in addition to having a refugee research center and doing a lot of um, research, scholarship, um, education, awareness about this um, humanitarian crisis. They have a lot of different programs, whether it is bursaries, whether it is access to education pathways. Um, you know, the, the one that I am going to, to quickly pose that and mention is York University is the first and only university so far in Canada that provides a sanctuary scholars program um, for those who would like to access education, but they cannot because of their status. So um, students with precarious status, as I mentioned earlier, are required to pay international fees, and that programs allows them to access education at a domestic fees, but also there is a, a, a wraparound support system to help them through a bridging program if they need um, a lot of support in terms of language training, um, credentials, and whatnot. Pretty great program that other institutions should look into. And then these are also some other institutions that are doing some initiative. In this case, uh, Lakehead University is, is, is offering some kind of legal support through different partnership. And that legal support is offered um, and available to migrants and refugee students uh, when they are looking to seek legal support. So a little bit about where do I come and, and, and how our organization has kind of played a role in responding to the global refugee crisis. Um, I founded the Newcomer Student Association back in 2016. It was born out of Ryerson. As an adult immigrant student myself, um, I faced a lot of challenges and barriers and I recognized that there is a gap within our institutions of not having a strong support system or, or infrastructure. Since then, we have been doing a lot of work, advocacy, grassroots mobilization, public education, but also directly supporting a lot of refugee students who knock on our door and need information. They need referrals. They need access to bursaries, helping them with their application. Um, so what we do is, as I said, a lot of uh, public education and awareness, but also we are currently co-leading a research project in partnership with Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario. Heko, to explore refugee students' persistence and graduation. And we often join different coalitions and movements that are pushing um, the envelope on refugees and access education issues. Moving forward, I think I put together some um, high level recommendations of what can be done um, to address the global refugee crisis as higher education institutions. I think we need to join other movements and other forces. We don't wanna be working in silos. There, there are a lot of movements and collective out there that are talking about the same issue, the global refugee crisis, internationalization, higher education, refugee students. So joining the, the, the efforts that are happening on the ground right now, not only work on silos. There are advocacy groups, there are governmental, non-governmental organizations, nonprofit, there are student-led groups, student union. I think it's it's time that all of these um, different bodies come together to say, how can we create a really support infrastructure um, and inclusive internationalization strategies to not only respond to the global refugee crisis out there, but what to do with the refugees who are currently Well, unfortunately, it seems that Sarah is, Sarah's line is frozen. 
There we go. Okay, let me let me thank Sarah very much for for her comprehensive overview of, uh, in particular, the Canadian landscape, but also uh, but also raising some important points for future discussion. Um, I'd like to move on by uh, inviting Wendy to uh, uh, to provide her remarks. And uh, trust me, I did not pay Sarah for that uh, for that promo. <laughs> so I. I I, I will try to I will try to build off what she said because I'm kind of thrilled that we're being studied. Um, so let me see. I think yes. I think this is my uh, slideshow. <clears throat> um, and I know there are lots of people who have lots to say, so I will try to be uh, try to be brief. I'm in the business school at Ryerson, and the reason that's important is because um, our approach to a lot of uh, a lot of uh, issues related, uh, especially to refugees, while grounded in a commitment to social justice, is really tied to economic interests, and we very much believe that um, immigrants and refugees are. Um, necessary for the the uh, social and economic development of Canada. The Research Institute has grown quite considerably. It's 130 full time um, staff. The university pays for one of them. It's all funded based on a range of grants. And so we have projects that are related to future skills, women's entrepreneurship, and other dimensions of diversity and inclusion. And because of the framing of this conference around social innovation, I just wanted to make a couple of points because when we think about one of university's biggest contributions to this work and frankly uh, to other social justice issues, for me it starts, I was the Vice President of Research and Innovation at Ryerson, to me it starts with challenging the assumptions about what is innovation. Because most post-secondary institutions, with respect, are very much dominated by a traditional notion of innovation as being technology related, focused on driving economic growth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we have giant commercialization offices and so on. But innovation is not inherently, nor is entrepreneurship, about making money. It's about doing things differently. It's not about inventing things, it's about changing behavior. And think about vaccinations, for example. The vaccination for COVID is not an innovation. When the vaccination is in my arm, that's the innovation. Once you have immunization, you have innovation. But inventing a vaccine is not innovation. Inventing artificial intelligence is not an innovation. It's only when it's used to do something for good or for evil that you have innovation. And so I think that if one of the first things universities do is think about their role in terms of driving innovation, economic and social development as broad, so that programs that are focused on inclusion of refugees and newcomers or, uh, you know, climate, uh, or uh, zero carbon or uh, fighting obesity or whatever those things are, are all viewed under the um, innovation umbrella and part of the core business of the university. I think that's very helpful. And we're, um, I led uh, Ryerson to be one of the first Ashoka Changemaker campuses. And that was partly because if you take this broader view of innovation, you also become more inclusive. Because if you say, oh, come, come talk about how to be an entrepreneur like Bill Gates, you'll get some business students, you'll get some engineering students. If you say, come and find out how to be a change maker, suddenly you'll get the arts and the social sciences and other students um, engaged in programs related to entrepreneurship and innovation. And so for me, the SDGs are an incredibly powerful way of driving inclusion for women and other underrepresented groups. And we also um, always look at issues, whether it's diversity and inclusion, whether it's <clears throat> dealing with the skills gap, whether it's technology adoption, or frankly, whether it's addressing 
the challenges around refugees, we always use complex systems and think about ecological models and what are the things at the societal level, the organizational level, and the individual level. So we're very focused on policy, for example, because there are a lot of stupid policies um, in Canada <clears throat> that are affecting pathways for refugees and other newcomers. <laughs> we look at policies and programs at universities because like there are some stupid programs there. And we look at individual uh, uh, attitudes and behaviors and how those things fit together. So I won't talk about, <clears throat> I won't talk much more about Lifeline uh, Syria, except to say, um, I'm the child of a refugee. I sponsored a Vietnamese family in 1979 when I was young. And uh, so my experience in this area didn't come from my academic training. I'm a PhD in management science, but more from my um, desire to combine what I knew about systems change because I worked on things like uh, technology adoption strategy and so on and how those principles can be applied to uh, other issues. So uh, we put together a program and based on that, we learned a lot about how to engage um, not just students and faculty and partners, but private industry, community organizations and so on to really harness additional resources to build social capital because social capital is almost more important than money for housing and food. Not more important, but equally important. Um, and getting jobs is actually uh, critical. So, uh, you know, I, I'm so thrilled. Like I, I got an email from one of the families I sponsored um, saying they, they are now Canadian citizens. Uh, the Hadid family, which was sponsored in Montreal, has now brought I think 30 members of their family and they're all doing well. The kids of refugees are superstars and so on and so on. So, you know, we're very bullish on this notion that refugees don't take things from Canada. Refugees bring things to Canada. And so essentially with Lifeline Afghanistan, we just um, lots of people were calling and saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And I was saying, I'm tired. I'm old. Why do I have to do anything? But we got a lot of uh, a lot of folks, and in fact, Tila Taraki, whose mom is a PhD student at McMaster Manufa Shin, uh, Shimvan, were the driving forces because it was really Tila who said, "I was told you could help," <laughs> and that's where Lifeline Afghanistan came from, and so. Um, Senator Ratna Amidvar, who had worked with me before, and Sally Armstrong also joined in, and then we got a bunch of groups together, and off we went. And we're focused on a few things, pathways, um, economic pathways, as well as refugee pathways, big focus on private sponsorship, because it's a unique in Canada social innovation that people are now replicating around the world. Um, like I said, a lot of government policies are stupid, and there's no question, there's lots of work that needs to be done. And this is another area universities can help because they're powerful, they can advocate. And I was amazed, Ellen Rock, who's a former university president, was presenting with me and uh, um, the former president of Centennial College. It was actually the president of University of Toronto who stood up and said, history will judge us if we treat Af Afghan refugees differently than Ukrainian refugees. So, you know, we need to hold the government for account. One good story of how bad policy is and something the universities can help with. Afghan student Memorial University completed the first term of their program successfully from Kabul since August, then was denied a student visa because the the bureaucrats did not believe he would return to Afghanistan. That dual intent on student visas is a stupid policy and post-secondary institutions and citizens should be pushing the government to get rid of it and to um, that would make a huge difference. Um, one of the things we we believe very strongly are Jobs are not just important for economic independence, but also mental health, especially for men.
And the problem of unemployment is often seen as a economic problem. I would argue it's actually a mental health problem as well. And so um, we are always looking for innovative approaches to create pathways to employment. We use entrepreneurship training, not because we expect people to become, you know, business owners necessarily, but entrepreneurship, again, if you think about universities, really innovative way to use experiential learning, to learn communication skills, to learn cultural competencies, to learn financial literacy, et cetera, et cetera. And while the traditional Canadian model is you come, we put you in a classroom for eight months, you learn English, then maybe you can wash dishes. Um, our, the evidence is pretty clear that doesn't work and there are much more innovative approaches to helping people learn the language while they're learning other things. And we're big proponents of work integrated learning um, and we're working with the future skills on sort of innovative approaches, to, whether it's teaching English, work integrated learning, upskilling, reskilling. Um, we're playing in that space and um, so, you know, from the point of view of post-secondary institutions, there are huge benefits, huge benefits, obviously to the community, huge benefits to students who can gain experiential um, learning or applied research opportunities. Huge, huge, huge um, value, I think, to opening up new pockets of, of students, building new pathways and so on and so forth. And so, you know, if we were to say what are the priorities, we're trying to get the university presidents and leaders to advocate hard on um, issues like dual intent. We're complementing the work of WUSC and SARS, which you'll hear more about. Um, we think there are more innovative ways we can use economic pathways to complement private sponsorship and, and so on. We're really pushing hard on um, thinking about this as a as a big project for the country to explore what works and what doesn't work. And of course, we're pushing private sponsorship. Magnet is a platform McMaster uses to help place students in student work um, opportunities and, and employment, but it's also incredibly powerful for linking uh, newcomers to employment. Perlater came to us and said, uh, can we have 5,000 Afghans, please? We have un unfilled positions across the country. And we had to say, you know, the government brought 25,000 Syrians to Canada in 100 days. And in 100 days, they brought exactly 5,000 Afghans. And the biggest difference, regardless of what anybody says, was leadership and commitment. John McCallum said, make it so. And Sean Fine was polishing his shoes or something. The other thing that universities have the power to do is drive changes in values and really shift the um, shift the narrative around um, you know this sort of paternalistic we're helping these poor little people who need us to really understanding that diversity and inclusion uh, drives our economic and social development. So, looking forward to the discussion. Really appreciate. Um, uh, the time that um, was allocated, and I will stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Wendy. Uh, I think you you raised some very important points uh, that undoubtedly will come back uh, during the discussion uh, or the the issues of pathways and opportunities created in a in a in a new environment and and how much role the government can play, and th those are all very important points. Um, I would like to, to now introduce Jenny uh, Dixon, the provost of uh, Universitas 21. Uh, I have the privilege of, uh, of serving as one of the senior leaders in that network. Um, and just last week, we had, a, uh, we had an excellent uh, conference where the topic of, of uh, refugees and, and forcibly displaced person was one of the topics that we discussed. Uh, so I'm... I'm
Peter noted I lead Universitas 21, which is a global network of 28 research intensive universities. And previously I was with the University of Auckland in Aotearoa, New Zealand, but I am speaking to you today from Birmingham, just for the record. Uh, the, the network was, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the network just to help set the context. It was founded 25 years ago. It was a project of 11 globally minded vice chancellors who believed in higher education, collaboration and internationalization. We've morphed from a project to a network community of, uh, as I said, 28 universities with more than a million students and over 200,000 staff. The focus of our work is on three key areas, educational innovation, researcher engagement, and student experience. Over the last two years of the pandemic, we delivered our programs online. Um, it's been incredibly rewarding as we have radically increased access for students and staff, and particularly those in more un underrepresented groups in the network who never would have been able to have had access to traditional forms of mobility. Our experience of collaboration and online delivery is I think quite relevant for the discussions today. So I'm gonna to touch a little bit on what some of our members are doing. Most of our members are connected with national refugee programs and they have a wide range of scholarships, hardship funds and various forms for refugee students. Our European members from Belgium, Ireland, Netherlands and Sweden work with a range of EU and NGO programs. Um, as you know, this work has accelerated pretty rapidly with more than 5 million displaced Ukrainians. At KU Leuven in Belgium, an emergency fund was established to receive Ukrainian researchers and students. In the UK, Student Action for Refugees, Universities of Sanctuary and Refugee Education UK are working to inform and coordinate university initiatives for students. And they work with the Council for At-Risk Academics for Displaced Researchers. Leuven has also opened up temporary positions to fleeing scientists and higher education professionals. Now, hot off the press, the University of Nottingham um, has had two key projects amongst others. Uh, it has um, secured accommodation on site for 30 refugees and is now exploring the best means to secure and sponsor refugees via the Homes for Ukraine scheme with other agencies. They also have 50 spaces and halls of residence allocated for students from their twinned Ukrainian university to provide sanctuary, IT and library services to allow them to continue studies remotely. This supports the Ukrainian open university concept recently discussed by UK and Ukrainian university leaders. And some of you may have heard about that. Our North American members um, have students, which of course includes um, McMaster, have students at risk bursaries supported by funds the University of Connecticut is developing a broader refugee support program. I'd also like to note here that the European Qualification Passport for Refugees supports displaced individuals by providing a special international tool developed to assess a refugee's qualifications when there is missing or insufficient documentation. And Sarah made reference to these gaps um, in people's records. This passport was developed in 2015 to 2017. So what the network has done is to collate all this information from across uh, its members, um, from its members, universities and members countries into one single resource, which will be placed soon on the U21 website. It's going to have to be updated regularly because as you'll be aware, country policies uh, do change quite quickly in response to all sorts of issues. So we'll be keeping it updated. And we hope that's going to be useful for displaced persons as they navigate higher education in the countries they find themselves in. So in, how, how do we go around about increasing refugee access to higher education, which is of course what we've been talking about today. Um, 
and we've already heard examples. Uh, we know that organizations are working in refugee camps around the world to promote higher education. One of these is called Empower, which works with refugee youth in camps. So far, it's provided workshops and mentoring for more than 20,000 young people. Yet we know that, as Sarah said, only 3% of refugees have access to higher education. The UNHCR and its partners uh, have committed to ensuring that 15% of young refugee women and men can access the benefits of higher education by the year 2030. That's the 15 by 30 target. Now, in terms of lifting refugee access to higher education, and we've heard some examples from Wendy, I've reflected on the work of an alumna from the University of Auckland, Rez Gardi, herself a refugee and now lawyer. She has highlighted that with few exceptions, and I think this is a really important issue, most countries have not implemented a specific policy to ensure access to higher education for refugees. Rez believes that the rapid move to online education worldwide, driven by the pandemic, is an opportunity for displaced people. And as many of us slip back into our new normal, she's called for online education and educational technologies to be harnessed to connect refugees and displaced populations to accredited academic institutions virtually. Already, some of the online learning platforms that we know, such as Coursera, Future Learn and Edix, often offer free courses for displaced people. At U21, we increased student access to our programs 18-fold when we delivered those programs online. We've seen the value of online access and there's no going back. But to note, however, when thinking about online delivery, we must also factor in access to devices and the internet, and at the same time acknowledge that online study can only be successful with support IT, library, accommodation, pastoral support. The, the Notting example I, I referred to earlier is a case in point. So we're here to talk about the role of higher education in addressing the global refugee crisis. My challenge to us all is to ask whether our next action must be to systematize responses to refugee crises and the needs of displaced students and academics. Sarah made reference to ad hoc initiatives, and we're all trying to do the best we can, but I'm saying let's be strategic about what we can do. This would bring responses to the heart of what universities do. I'm referring here to a specific SDG higher education measurement and how that could flow into rankings. I believe that there is an opportunity to drive higher education delivery for displaced persons by using these measurements. I do need to acknowledge how difficult it was to get a refugee reference at all into the SDGs. But let's think on a bit further. In 2022, the responsibilities and duties of universities have expanded greatly, and we, and we talked about this a lot in the network. We've managed through a pandemic with online delivery for students and of course, distance research for academics. So we keep going and um, made some amazing um, innovative advances in the process. We are increasingly mindful of student online and campus experiences though, as we all adapt to this new normal of delivery. We've worked with government vaccine mandates and closed borders. We've also seen student and staff mental health issues increasing dramatically. So universities have demanding pastoral care issues that we have to meet, the wraparound services. And in our post-COVID-19 environment, publicly funded universities are facing funding restraints as governments must work their budgets to respond to health demands, debt, cost of living crises. And we're hearing an awful lot about that across the globe. In this environment, universities are reassessing their role um, and we can talk perhaps more about that in the, in the discussion, and prioritizing what they do and what they have the funding to do 
So my question is, can universities at this time adequately meet the individualized needs of refugee students? And while we may want to meet those needs and do more, is that realistic? My point here, and, and Wendy was making reference to this, is that there are highly skilled NGOs, specialists and community groups that have worked with refugees for decades. Should universities now focus more on supporting these experts directly and by promoting them and advocating with our key stakeholders? Peter, I'll end here and look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. This was uh, this was quite uh, quite interesting, uh, and uh, I I would guess that it leads uh, quite naturally into into Bonnie's uh, comments and Bonnie's observations. Uh, um, and I would like to uh, would like to invite Bonnie to uh, to deliver his remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, and thank you, uh, Nicole, for organizing this important conversation. It's an honor to be with such uh, knowledgeable uh, panelists uh, to speak about this very important issue. So I, I want to start my interventions today with the theme of uh, the Catalyst uh, event. Uh, the theme of this year's uh, Catalyst uh, event is let's energize or re-energize uh, the SDG. And uh, for me, uh, what that theme connotes is the recurring question, how do we make the sustainable development goals real? Um, this, the full title of the sustainable development goals is actually the sustainable development goals for the 2030 agenda. Uh, so this is a 15 year plan the world leaders have signed on to. Uh, with targets to be met uh, by 2030. Uh, so in some ways, we're midway between that vision. And if you recall, uh, before the Sustainable Development Goal, we had the Millennium Development Goal, you know, these targets that were set by world leaders in 2000 uh, to be achieved in 2015. Uh, the consensus is that not much of the targets of the Millennium Development Goals were ever achieved. Uh, so in 2015, uh, world leaders came together and said, well, let's set new targets. And so we set the Sustainable Development Goal, and we're midway into that. So I think the, the overarching theme of this conference really gives us an opportunity to think about the goals we set and how we achieve them. Uh, in the, uh, the commitment to equitable inclusion, equitable education for all. Uh, so the reference point here is Sustainable Development Goal 4 uh, and to ensure inclusive and equitable education and to promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. It's a cardinal part of the Sustainable Development Goal and it is within that framework of the Sustainable Development Goal, specifically SDG number four, that I will be speaking uh, today interventions around five key themes, uh, uh, themes that address the central question, what role can higher education play uh, in addressing the refugee crisis? And related to that question, I will be addressing what I consider the imperatives of inclusive and equitable internationalization. So the five key themes I want to speak to are one, the community service obligation of higher education institution. Uh, two, questions of access. Uh, three, advocacy. Four, research. And finally, recognizing the reciprocity of inclusive and equitable internationalization. So let us start with the community service obligation of higher educational institutions. So we proceed from the premise uh, that universities have uh, service obligation. Uh, universities are established to educate, but also with a mandate to serve the community. When we talk about the mandates of university, we often talk about teaching, research, and service. And who do we serve? We serve the community. Uh, we serve not just the local communities or the national communities. I would argue that institution 
have an obligation towards our global community. Uh, so the global community, it's also part, serving the global community, it's also part of the mandate of universities. So right from the beginning, we need to begin to think about the service obligation of edu higher educational institutions, not just uh, in the within the confines of, of you know, local communities, uh, but more broadly in the context of a global uh, community. And this brings me to one of the challenges that I think confronts us when we think about how universities can do just that. Uh, because increasingly we see in Canada and in many a shift towards what has been described as the resource extractive model of internationalization. Uh, amidst dwindling uh, government's grants, uh, international students are seen primarily as ways of, of subsidizing university budgets. Uh, high fee paying international students are ways to complement shortfalls in university budget. It is an unethical approach, but it's also an unsustainable approach. And that I think is one of the main challenges to uh, inclusive internationalization. Even before we start talking about refugees and how to support them, the model is inherently flawed. Uh, and I think if we begin to think more of the obligations of university as service to the international community, the first thing we need to do is to confront these increasingly resource extractive model of internationalization. That seems to be the dominant model these days in many higher institutions. We need to think about how to frame uh, universities and position university to meet their local and international service obligation. Uh, the other point that I would emphasize is access. It is one that uh, my colleagues on the panel have already spoken to. Uh, university can support internationalization and particularly uh, refugees and displaced learners uh, by creating pathways, uh, by making uh, these spaces more accessible uh, to international students. Um, again, here we confront a major challenge, uh, the vulnerabilities uh, of international students. We all know about private institutions, um, higher institutions and private institutions that are increasingly taking advantage of international students. And we need to think about how to address that. And uh, when I talk about accessibility, I'm thinking here about how universities and higher educational institutions do recruitment. And I'll give you an example of that. So typically universities think of international recruitment in terms of attracting the best of the best from around the world to come study in our universities. In some universities, a student affairs department uh, send recruiters around the world to recruit students, high fee paying students uh, into universities. And I've often wondered who do we reach when we adopt that model as the sole um, way of reaching out uh, to international students. When we go for these uh, international uh, recruitment fairs, it's often the elites uh, that we are reaching. Uh, we do not reach the vulnerable. Uh, we, are, we are selling the universities to, to the elites, to a narrow group of elites. And I've often wondered if there is a way to also bring the opportunities that university offer uh, to vulnerable people around the world, uh, to working with uh, organizations such as the UNHCR, the United Nations, the High Commission for Refugees, NGOs working in refugee camps, about scholarship opportunities, uh, entrance opportunities uh, to displaced and vulnerable populations and learners uh, that are not within the exalted spaces uh, where we recruit as, as universities. So access works both ways. Uh, we have to think about our communication strategies and how we make that work. So very quickly, three more things. Advocacy, we've already talked about advocacy, the visa process, and how difficult it is, even if, I mean, we're not even talking about refugees here, just getting a visa to come study in Canada and in most Western countries is, uh, is difficult, even more so uh, for, for refugees, uh, displaced scholars and displaced learners, possibly displaced learners. So I think university, 
has, have an obligation. University, colleges, all higher institutions have an, an obligation to be advocates, uh, policy advocates, to, to, to uh, push governments uh, to make our institutions more accessible to the most vulnerable uh, who might not otherwise get the opportunities uh, for higher education. Research, that's what we do well. Uh, universities are bastions of, of research. And here there are opportunities uh, for research that ultimately improved a lot of vulnerable communities around the world, particularly refugees. I'm glad that reference has already been made uh, to centers for refugee studies. Uh, one area of research that I think uh, needs work is changing the perception that refugees are a drain on society. Uh, whether we like it or not, that is the public perception out there. That's the conventional wisdom. Uh, we need empirical studies, uh, evidence-based studies uh, that reinforce the point that uh, refugees and newcomers are estranged to Canada, to our societies, not a dream. Uh, we need research uh, that reinforces the point that uh, refugee rights must be protected. Here are the center justice. We have prioritized international human rights research on the plight of refugees, particularly in the large refugee camps uh, in Turkey, uh, in Somalia, and other parts of the world. So I think universities can uh, take the lead uh, in these kinds of empirical research uh, that, that provide opportunities for, for refugees. Uh, and, and then finally, uh, I would like to emphasize the point about the reciprocity of uh, inclusive and equitable internationalization. Uh, recognizing that much of what we've been talking about is not charity. Uh, much of what we're talking about is more than just humanitarianism. Uh, it's not just about being kind or nice to vulnerable populations. We have to recognize there is something in need for us as universities. And what is that? So if we say as institutions of higher learning, as universities, uh, we are trying to solve the problems of the world. We want to make the world a better place. Here at McMaster, our, our mantra is a brighter world. Well, how do you create a brighter world without engaging with the problems of the world? How do you create a brighter world without engaging with the perspectives of the most vulnerable within the global community? So in some ways, it is imperative for universities and the universities at least that position themselves as trying to solve global problems to look beyond uh, what benefits them directly uh, in order to be relevant, uh, in order to, to within we have to be seen as addressing some of the most intractable problems in the world. And I think the refugee crisis from Ethiopia to Syria to Yemen to Afghanistan is one of the most pressing challenges of our day, perhaps alongside uh, the, the climate crisis. So we need to see this as not just charity or humanitarianism, but something that is at the core of what we do as universities and institutions. And only when we position these ideas in terms of a two-way street, a uh, mutually beneficial interaction, I worry that we might not have enough political will and commitment to do it uh, and do it well. I'll stop there and, and look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Uh, that was that was yeah. great. And uh, let me just thank all the all four panelists for their for their outstanding introductory uh, remarks. Uh, we have a number of questions in the chat, but I will take moderator's privilege and start with a question that I'm deriving in part from Bonnie's comments regarding being aware and cognizant of resource extraction. Um, that I think is, is a critical point. And let me, let me just pose the following question to, to the, the panel in that, in that regard. Uh, we, we, are, we are focusing, of course, on, on supporting refugees and displaced scholars from a humanitarian perspective. Those are individuals that clearly need assistance. 
But over the past number of years, um, there have been many conversations about the fact that war and conflict makes the brightest people leave their respective countries. And so I think, I, I would suppose that there is an obligation also to work with institutions in the countries from where these refugees come to make sure that they are not rate, being raided of their intellectual capital. And so I was just wondering um, if you could maybe spend a couple of minutes thinking about how, how can we maintain the connections for the time when, when war is finished and countries try to rebuild their intellectual infrastructure? How can we make sure that, that, that the people that we supported have an opportunity to maybe go back and, and help the rebuilding process? Um, maybe, maybe Sarah, uh, I, could, I could put you on the spot. Maybe you have some thoughts on that because you've been really heavily involved in sort of the, the individual aspects of, of the refugees. Yeah, thank you, Peter. And I do want to apologize. I don't know what happened. I was wrapping my presentation and I was just kicked out of the Zoom room. I do apologize about that. Uh, that is really an interesting question. I think I can speak from my personal experience coming to Canada as an immigrant, as a newcomer, and, and, and as someone who has survived um, war twice back home. I do come from a war-torn country. So um, I feel for us refugees or displaced populations and, and those who are fleeing war, we do feel that sense of obligation to give back. Um, and sometimes there is a really fine line when you feel guilty of leaving everything behind, even leaving the culture, the people, the family, and coming here and you're giving back to Canada, you're giving back to the people, you're trying to support other refugees. But I think um, we keep open lines with where we come from and we hold those cultures really near and dear and we represent the countries we come from. Um, I think there is also a lot of ways to kind of, there, there, within the settlement sector where I work, there is a lot of pre-arrival programs where we try to help our people and, and, and other populations who are displaced from other countries um, to help them to come to Canada um, and offer them that safe pathway uh, through providing information and um, pre-arrival information so they can come to Canada. Um, I'm not sure if this answers your question, but... Uh... Yeah, certainly, certainly it does. I, I think it, it just came, came to mind because, because there, is, there is, of course, concern about ultimately rebuilding. I mean, many of these refugees leave for very specific reasons and they they do want to go back many of them do want to go back and so the question is how do we support that return movement uh uh into their home countries but i see wendy has as yeah if i can elaborate that i feel there is a more of a political conversation that can uh, take place here because um, we do want to come back. The question is, can we? Um, I know for many Syrian refugees, we can. They cannot. I know that for many Palestinian refugees, they cannot. So I feel there has to be more of a global political pressure conversation happening to keep those doors open. Because for so many who are displaced, they just can't go back, even though they want to go back. Um, so I, I, yeah, I think Wendy maybe can has more to say on this. Yeah, Wendy, please. Yeah, I think we have to be kind of careful not to be, um, to recognize the, the, the circumstances are really different. So uh, my father was a Holocaust survivor. Uh, he did not want to go back to Poland. On, on the other hand, the Ukrainian refugees are coming to Canada. Most of them do want to go back to the Ukraine. Um, people who fled Vietnam after the war, it's mixed. Some have, some have not. So I think it, the, the only reason I say that is because I think some of our policies, like the dual intent policy for students applying for uh, student visas, 
are based on an outdated notion that we have to protect um, other countries by insisting that you know the that people can come here and get an education but they can't stay and so in my mind flexibility is what's important and obviously if we support refugees and becoming economically independent they have more choices one of the big problems canada has right now is a lot of young immigrants who have come on the economic pathway want to leave because they have not achieved uh, what they want and they have lots of options so for me we have to recognize the circumstances under which refugees come to canada are vastly different and it's really dangerous i think to develop policies or principles based on assumptions that everyone does want to go back or that everybody wants to stay here because we're so awesome thank you that's uh, that is absolutely true of course uh jenny i, I just like to say yes absolutely agree with all of those um observations i do think the idea of the open university for example in ukraine is a really interesting initiative and one that's that people should really think about in terms of if you have people who have have to absolutely leave but we in this case many of them will want to go home and are actually facilitating ongoing studies while they're actually out of their country is a really practical and 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 very supportive um initiative that universities can do um if you can put the services around them let them carry on with their communities, their studies, they'll be able to, you know, hopefully be able to go back soon and resume their studies, or they may even have to, to complete them. But if, if, you, if you get a system of good cross credits and all of those sorts of things, um, I think that's a very practical thing that universities can do. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, that, that brings us back to your, uh, the point that you made about our the the experience that collectively has been developed with virtual and and online learning uh, those are th there's infrastructure in place yeah. nowadays that enables such large scale uh, mm -hmm. supportive supportive efforts um, um, I would like to pick up uh, a question from from the chat here and that has to do uh, there's there's interest in learning a bit more about the private sponsorship uh pathways that both sarah and and wendy mentioned um could you maybe uh comment a bit more about what those are and who who are the who are the supporters of such sponsorship programs typically do you want me to try sarah so uh private sponsorship was uh, i think initiated in canada in 1979 in response to the need to resettle Indo-Chinese uh, refugees. The original target was to bring 5,000 and we ended up, I think, with more than 60. So the idea with uh, private sponsorship is basically to reduce the burden on the state and to engage citizens in the, um, in the resettlement effort. And I would argue it has, um, it has two benefits. One is um, you know, as many people will say, it's like landing and having a family because you have the social capital, which is so important to navigate systems, get a job and so on. But the other observation is that virtually everyone who has been involved in private sponsorship will say they got more out of it than they gave. And it's also been, um, and we have research to support this, for example, private sponsorship of Syrian refugees was a powerful antidote to Islamophobia because in small communities where they'd never seen someone in a hijab, suddenly they're, you know, we had to almost get security for one family because so many people in the community were showing up with casseroles and free stuff. And the relationships there that were built because people actually knew each other rather than just, you know, reading about each other were incredibly powerful. The way it works is simply that um, a group of people, they can be friends, they can be colleagues, workers, whatever, agree to support um, the individual, the family, whatever, for a period of 12 months. And um, the costs are fairly modest. It's You have to commit, I think, something like 25000 for a family of four, an individual is more, and so on. And the idea is that um, you take responsibility for making sure they have housing and food 
and ideally um, pathways to employment. There are two ways to do it. One is through sponsorship agreement holders and the sponsorship agreement holders are often faith-based organizations or others who can actually identify um, candidates to come to Canada and then the private sponsors work with them. Or there's something called group of five, which allows you to do it yourself without an intermediary, but only if you're sponsoring um, people who have been uh, designated as refugees by UNHCR. And uh, Canada's private sponsorship of Syrian refugees was, I think about 25,000 of the, of the 50 or so that have come. And often what happens is families are sponsored and then they sponsor mm -hmm. and they sponsor. So the Vietnamese family we sponsored um, you know, sponsored their brothers and sisters and parents. And one of the real success stories in Canada is the rate of social mobility. So your parents' education is not a predictor of your uh, social class in a way it is in other countries. So, you know, the kids of the dishwashers and the factory workers uh, who were the first generation are doctors, PhDs, accountants, and and so on. Thank you very much, uh, Wendy. I, I'd like to uh, to take up another question and maybe ask Bonnie to to comment because you 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 talked about refugee camps uh, in various countries. So the question is. Um, uh, posed by Francisco, I know a 13 year old girl in a refugee camp who dreams to have a higher education. What should be done to increase opportunities of girls like this to increase the chances of getting to higher education when her family is resettled? Uh, thank you very much for that question. I mean, that speaks to uh, one of the issues that I try to raise in my, in my presentation, the, the question of access. And I know this firsthand. Uh, that when uh, universities are marketed uh, in, in, in parts of the world, very often the, the message is very narrowly targeted at the elites in those societies. Uh, you've we've all attended uh, university recruitment fairs. Uh, who comes to these fairs? Uh, these are prep school students, these are elites who have access, who have the information. And so in some ways, even when opportunities exist, uh, like scholarships and grants, uh, the information uh, typically is confined to those who already have access. And so one of the things that I think universities and higher educational institutions could be doing uh, is to try and go beyond these narrow group. I have to admit, it will be a challenge uh, because uh, the kind of communities and the kind of uh, people that they, the person who asked this question talked about, uh, a 16, 17 year old girl in a refugee camp in say in Dadawa camp in, in, in Kenya would probably not have access to that and universities do not have the capacity to go to every refugee camps. But I think there are creative ways to partner with organizations that are already doing that, NGOs, uh, Oxfam, Feed the Children, there are a lot of NGOs uh, that are doing uh, these kinds of work on the ground. And, and what will be required will be for uh, institutions of higher education to partner in some ways in these opportunities uh, to, to the knowledge of those who might typically not have access to it. So we have to create it. It's a little bit more work, but it's not impossible. And I think if we're serious about uh, inclusive internationalization. Our recruitment strategy has to be more creative uh, to reach those that we, we, we haven't reached. I mean, just to give you an example, we keep on talking about um, diversifying internationalization in, in, in Canada. Uh, the figures, the latest figures I saw from Ontario uh, say that 70% uh, of all undergraduate, international undergraduate students in Ontario come from three countries. Uh, and you, know, you can imagine the implications of that. Uh, I've talked about sustainability, but also the risk uh, that you know, our internationalization agenda is not diverse, it is not robust, it is not resilient. All it will take is one geopolitical tension 
and you know the house will come crashing down. So we need to be more creative in how we reach out to the rest of the world uh, in our internationalization agenda. Thank you, Bonnie. I have uh, I have Wendy uh, Wendy's hand up, and then I, I'd like to I'd like to ask uh, Jenny a question afterwards. Just a quick pursuit. I think a, a great national project for Canadian universities would be the Free University, and there's one in the U.S. As far as I know, McGill is the only Canadian participant, but. A lot of faculty will teach overload because they love teaching or, you know, and they'll get 75 at my institution, $7,500 a course, which isn't worth the money, you know, after taxes, it's 3500 and so on. I actually believe we could run a free university based on volunteer work uh, by faculty. You know, if somebody asked me to teach six courses, three hours a piece, half a half a course a year, I'd do it. And I bet 10% of my colleagues would as well. And if the universities would agree to accredit those free courses, we would, we would create transformational change in my view. And, you know, the technology can support it. Um, it's really the, the accreditation and credential recognition and collaboration that is the biggest barrier. Absolutely, uh, that's a topic that uh, that is being discussed and has been discussed for decades, right? The, the, this is nothing new. Uh, Jenny, I wanted to ask you uh, how you see uh, the role of, of international higher education networks in, in that space, uh, both both actually connected to, to the idea of, of a free university, but also uh, combining combining efforts in, in going out to, to find these underrepresented or at risk uh, students in, in very difficult situations. Mm. Uh, right, well, I think there's so many things to talk about here and we haven't got too much time left, but I think, I, think, I, I guess I come back to, to my earlier points about being quite strategic in terms of where we place our efforts and what we can achieve. And I'm, I'm mindful that we don't we need to systematize what we do i think i think that networks are actually in a good place to do that and one of the things that networks really haven't done is to is to kind of work with other networks um and we touched a little bit on this in our network meeting last last week um and this is where i think you have to get the, the power of um universities and with other organizations coming together to actually achieve the kinds of, I think, the, re the outreach that we're talking about here. I think when you bring people together in a large group uh, or, or you bring resources together, you can actually do more. So I would, I, that, that would be my cautionary note here. Universities are large and very diverse organizations. They have, they have to have core funding to run them. They have to be focused on their, their, their budgets in order to do all the things that they, they want to achieve. And I, but I do think we could look to, I think, bringing, bringing the, the, the sort of the, the power that universities have, universities have collectively to come, on the, to come and look at these problems. I've talked earlier about the, the, the power of online, and I do think that's one way that we could actually really upscale. And that's what we've done within our own network. But I do think we could really upscale, particularly in talking about some of the issues that we've been addressing in this panel. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes left and I would like to give uh, Sarah the opportunity to uh, provide some, some closing observations, closing remarks. Thank you. Uh, I, I think that was an excellent discussion, bringing different insights and, and perspective. Um, and I think in closing, uh, I really, um, my interest is really on the institutional side of things. Why? we haven't made a lot of progress in the agenda of an inclusive international higher education and its relation to addressing the global refugee crisis. And I think from a comparative perspective, looking at other 
um, refugee receiving jurisdictions, the UK, for example, Germany and the US, I know that there are excellent best practices there that we can look at and learn from. Uh, but I also know that when it comes to higher education, there is a lot at stake when we talk about institutional reputation, uh, global ranking and accreditation. And, and I know from working within that accreditation space for the last year or so, I know that um, we are required to report to our um, accreditors, what are we doing in terms of sustainable development goals? What are we doing in terms of global engagement impact and sustainability? So there's a lot of conversation happening. Um, and I feel it, it might be that the institutions wanna take the initiative and uh, you know, walk the talk of equity, diversity, and inclusion as one of their priorities or principles or mandates that equity, diversity, and inclusion. But oftentimes when we talk about EDI work and principles, the refugee and displaced populations are just falling in the crack. There is far more uh, priorities that the institutions have recently started to address, but we don't see a lot of progress made and we don't see the needle moving when it comes on conversation around displaced and refugees. So um, definitely it would be great to see that institutions want to do something to, to as part of their internationalization strategies. And we want to see these kind of embedded across the culture, policy, practice, and programs within the institutions. Sometimes I feel it's just happening because, okay, well, accreditation is up in five years. What have we done in terms of EDI or global engagement or impact or sustainable development goals? But um, the conversation to be continued um, and there is a lot to be done for sure, but thanks for having us. Thank you very much, Sarah. And I, I hope that uh, conversations like this uh, will, will continue and that they uh, can contribute to maybe making progress, uh, as you pointed out, to, uh, on, on, on the path to being more inclusive and, uh, and supporting a diverse population, whether they be refugees or not. Um, and, and with that, I, I really would like to thank all our panelists uh, for, for just excellent contributions. Um, I would like to thank uh, our audience uh, for, for staying with us and uh, for submitting questions. We will try to, to answer the questions in the, in the chat or, or at least move them to, uh, uh, to people who might have an answer. And um, with that, I'll pass it uh, over to uh, to Nicole or Maria, yep. uh, the Great. key organizers, to uh, to say thanks and uh, goodbye. Yeah. So I know we're over time, but that was worth it. Uh, really good conversation, and I, I do. I feel like this could be a conference topic. Really, there's a lot we could cover. Um, and I know Sarah actually uh, organized a conference um, on this specific topic. So. Uh, maybe there's an opportunity for us to reconvene with with more speakers at some point. So thank you so much for being here um, for Catalyst 20, um, 2030. Um, and uh, I believe some information was shared in the chat around if you're interested in joining that network and Jenny mentioned networks and the importance of networks connecting with networks. So that would be an interesting um, opportunity for some of you um, to connect in with um, you know, across sectoral network of uh, social innovators and people in the private sector, as well as higher education. Um, this will be re this is what's recorded um, and it will be shared with you all um, afterwards. So you'll have a copy and certainly people who couldn't make it will be able to, to watch the recording. Um, so without further ado, thank you so much and uh, hope to see you all again. Thanks. Oh, oh, I might be in trouble. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Thanks. Bye bye. Okay. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>